Hi everyone, I'm Charlene Habermeyer of Good Parenting Brighter Children, and this is Tidbits of Wisdom for Parents. Today I want to talk about creativity. How do you foster creativity and problem solving skills with your kids? Well, there's some fun ways we can we can do it, and I'll, like, I'll talk about two ways. The first thing is, this is a game that you can play with your kids. It's a, loads of fun, actually. And the more people that you have uh, playing this, the merrier. You need to go to Lowe's or Home Depot or someplace, and you need to buy a tarp. And on one side of the tarp, you need one color. On the other side of the tarp, you need another color. Now, depending on how many people are going to be playing, like if you only have two, then you don't want to buy an 8x10 tarp. You know, the smaller the group, the smaller the tarp. Usually this is a lot of fun when there's about 20 to 25 people playing it. So get your kids, get their friends, get your relatives, do it as a holiday something or a birthday something uh, game. And um, this is how you do it. You lay the tarp down on the ground. You have everyone take off their shoes. Everyone stands on the tarp and then you give them the rules. And the rule is this. They're going to completely turn the tarp over on the other side to the other color without anybody getting off the tarp and without anybody, you can't have any chairs or tables or anything around there where people can lean on while they're flipping this over. Now there's actually, a, you know, like everything in life, there's a secret on how to do this and you can do it pretty much, and it doesn't matter if you have 40 people on the tarp, you can flip this over in a matter of a couple of minutes. But the whole idea is you're teaching your kids problem solving skills and teamwork skills. Now, those are really two very, very important skills that they're going to need for the 21st century and to be um, amazing employ employees or employers. You have to have problem solving skills and you have to work as a team. So it's very interesting. When I did this with my college students, there was usually between 20 and 25 or so students on an 8 by 10 tarp. And uh, most of them, you know, they all figured it out eventually, but it's a lot of fun and they really have to work. What's interesting to watch is when you're doing this as a family, don't you become the power person. You let one of your children take over and you allow it to see which child is going to take over and be the leader. Oftentimes it's not the person that you suspect. It's not necessarily the first child in the family. It can be another one of the children in the family, sometimes even the youngest one in the family that sees what's going on, sees the picture, sees how this needs to happen. So that's one idea. Another one has to do with movies. Now this is kind of a thing that I've done in my mind for, gosh, forever it seems like. But when I go to a movie, I kind of, I'm always looking for different ways of learning and teaching. So I kind of, as the movie is going, I'm breaking it down into scenes. I'm breaking it down into segments. And in my mind, I think, okay, how can I relate this to different things like science or math or social studies or language arts or reading or what other, you know, what subject can I relate this to with this scene? So it just gets your mind going. So let me, let's take an example. We're going to take Fantasia 2000. And let me, I'll explain to you what we're going to do and then you can do it and try it out with your kids or if you go to a movie over the holidays or at birthdays or whenever you go to the movies, um, try this out. Okay, Fantasia 2000, when it came out in January of 2000, a lot of people looked at it like it was a great Disney animation with classical music. Now that's pretty much how they looked at the original uh, Fantasia. But that's just looking on the surface. There is a ton of stuff in these two movies, but let's focus on Fantasia 2000. First of all, it's a wordless movie. There's, no, uh, there's obviously sound, but there's no words. There's nobody necessarily talking except there are introductions into each segment. Okay, so wordless books, there's a number of different wordless books. The first one that comes to mind is Lynn Ward's uh, The Silver Pony. There's also uh, Noah and the Ark, I think it's by uh, Peter Spear. Anyway, wordless books are actually very powerful books for kids because they put a child in the driver's seat, so to speak. Now, they're in, they're in charge of how that story is going to turn out. They're the ones giving all the dialogue. They're the ones saying, okay, based on these pictures, there's no words, but this is what I'm saying is happening. This will help to build not only their vocabulary, but it helps to build their imagination. So the very first thing that you can do with Fantasia 2000 is when you're watching it with your kids is just say, hey, we're in the driver's seat. 
yes, this is what's going on, but we, need, we can create different aspects of this story. The other thing that you want to consider is word association. We're going to talk about the very last one, and this is Igor Stravinsky's Firebird Suite, and it's about a sprite who represents nature, about an elk, and about a firebird. Okay, so in this one, um, you know, they're using the music of the Firebird Suite, and the sprite represents nature. Nature reawakens spring and everything in the forest, but then the firebird awakens, and the firebird goes and through fire destroys everything. So what you can do in terms of word association is you can use the word nature. What are all the different things that apply to nature? Or you can use the word fire. What are all the different words and phrases that apply to fire? The next thing is, is you want idea generation. Okay, so you want to talk about all the different ideas. You want to talk maybe about what the plot of the story is or how you would create it or, or what details that you would put in. The next thing that you want to do is make connections. And connections are making connections to different subjects. Now, obviously, I'm a teacher, but it's a great thing that you can do with your kids as well. For instance, okay, so you have the um, sprite who wakes up nature. You have the firebird who causes this major forest fire. Then the sprite and the elk get together, and, and they go through and they heal nature. So in terms of literature, it's good triumphing over evil, which is a very common um, basis and theme of a lot of books. Look at the Harry Potter books. Look at every single solitary fairy tale out there. It all starts, they have protagonists and antagonists in every good piece of literature. And you're going to find this um, in, so you'll see that in literature and you'll see that in the movie. So it's good triumphing over evil. Another thing that you can do, it and relate it to math, and talk to your children, let's, let's look in and let's research what fire does, the, the amount of damage that it does, and what that costs to human, human beings, what it actually costs. So you can look at the, the fires that are going on right now in California, the devastating, horrible fires. What does that cost in terms of lands and property and homes and even lives and pets and everything that is lost in a fire? It's astounding what is lost. But then look at the flip side. We know from a lot of fires that have happened, particularly the fires that happened in Yellowstone and also the volcano that happened in Washington, the state of Washington, that sometimes these natural disasters have a cleansing effect on the environment. They actually help the environment. So you can talk about that, but in terms of math and estimation, you are estimating the amount of dollars that that would cost. Another thing is science. There's all kinds of different things that you can do with science. First of all, how does a fire extinguisher, extinguisher work? Talk to your kids about that. Another thing is talk to them about seasons and cycles, how the cycle or how the seasons of the earth you know, are cyclic, and what happens to the phase of the earth during each one of these seasons. What happens in fall and winter and spring and summer? How does the landscape look? What are the trees, the flowers, the birds? How are they all affected by each one of these seasons? You know, the other thing is you can talk to them about history. And this is an interesting one. This is a story that I want to tell you. I'm sure you're all familiar with the bubonic plague that happened during the Dark Ages. In terms of numbers, they didn't keep uh, correct numbers as we do today, but it was estimated that between 25 and 40 million people were killed in the bubonic plague or died from the bubonic plague. All right, think about how many millions of people live in your state and then divide that by between 25 and 40 million. And you can estimate and see just how many states in the United States that would have affected. Now, yes, lives were lost and it's considered the worst disaster in the history of the world. But what these people who died, they left behind their lands, their property, their possessions, and their clothes. And their clothes were made from cotton. Now this is a time of Gutenberg and the printing press, and they were having problems with paper. The vellum and the parchment papers were not going through. They were too thick to go through the printing press. But when this horrible disaster came, what they did is they took all the clothes and they turned them to mulch and they created what is called cotton rag paper. It's still available today. It's still some of the highest quality paper that you can buy. 
if you are saving and doing any kind of genealogical records that you want to make sure that the ink that touches the paper is not an acid ink, you'd want to use cotton rag paper. So anyway, they took the cotton rag paper and as a result, it was perfect for the printing press. Now, explain to your children that there's always a silver lining in every cloud. And the silver lining in this cloud was they were able to make tons and tons of paper. And from that paper, they went to the printing press and they were able to make tons of books. And so education and reading went to the masses. All right, now these are just a few very simple examples of problem-solving skills and helping your kids to become creative and make connections and have idea association and word association and idea generation. These are just some things to help you, to help your child to become more creative. It's an activity that you will be doing with your kids and that will help them as well. We'll talk more about this in the future. If you want to have um, more specific ideas, then be sure and refer to my book, Good Parenting, Brighter Children. You can also find a number of resources in my resource, my protected resource library on my blog, Good Parenting, Brighter Children. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you tomorrow.